Hello everyone, it's Mike Levin. Monday, July 18th, at around 9.30 a.m. And th the thing on my mind right now is, as a result of listening to a Raymond Hedinger talk, uh, giving a talk called Beyond Pep 8 to an audience at PyCon 2015, I believe it was, and he was talking about uh, Pep 8 enforcement and uh, how it starts out with him talking about if you weren't to try and pull the punches too much, how people who jump on Pep 8 enforcement as their main thing as being people who put aside any real creativity or, you know, pushing themselves to solve complex problems and expressing themselves uh, creatively and eloquently in favor of the hobgoblin little mind consistency thing that pep aid enforcers who go in and step in over other people's code uh, find comfort in because precisely because they are not that type of thinker. And it gives them an easy set of rules. If you do this and you do that, you can mark this and that off as done. Things you did of value uh, each day. And really that kind of uh, pseudo quality control nonsense is, well, it's just that, it's nonsense. Uh, he modifies his view of Pep-8 enforcement uh, on things like the 80 column limit uh, to say it should be 90-ish. So you don't get worried about all those Pep-8ers uh, when you get up to that, you know, 75 character length going. If I go beyond this and I check it into GitHub, then some nitwit is gonna come along and reformat it and call it of value, even though, even if it commits atrocities. Uh, he uses the word atrocities a lot in his descriptions of uh, misguided pep aid enforcement, where you might shorten variable names or break things at a square bracket where it doesn't make sense. And uh, otherwise, stomp all over the work and the clarity of someone who actually does have a creative bone in their body. And uh, this resonated uh, fairly true with me. Uh, and then, as his speech continued, he went on to points like, uh, the eval statement is actually used in things like the named tuple. Uh, I believe uh, Raymond Hedinger says the named tuple is one of his, and one of the details of its implementation is the use of the eval statement, which as a prior video of mine uh, suggested, is really what separates static thinkers, people who take comfort and security in a rigid set of involatile rules that everyone has to be forced to follow for mostly the reason that there was once a C compiler in the picture and that static static typed variables created tight compiled EXEs that ran uh, optimally fast and minimized the chance of crashes and memory leaks and stack overflows and all that kind of happy stuff. But the truth is the world has never swung completely that direction and dynamic code execution environments not only are still around but they're rapidly becoming the norm. Every one of these uh, runtime environments, virtual machine type things, is pretty much capable because it's, you know, not 
compiled machine code, it's pseudo-compiled P code, lots of words for it, but it's compiled for a virtual machine and probably uses a simpler instruction set than uh, the host hardware and probably has a whole bunch of uh, safety uh, features in place, memory protection, uh, such that it's no big deal to have an eval statement in your language. You execute some new code, make some new P code, load it into the runtime engine, and you have beautifully and possibly powerful self-modifying code of the type that people who hate the eval statement are, are basically scared of. And yeah, it's absolutely true. That kind of code can create runaway tasks, runaway memory, crash your machines, crash your hardware. But you know what? As we move towards uh, more complex networks doing the processing, because any system doing processing now should no longer be thought of as a tight, self-contained unit of hardware, except in those cases where it actually truly is, say has no net connection, but anything with a net connection can send part of its processing elsewhere. And the faster the communication on that network, the more neural net-like it's gonna be, and the more resiliency you can bake into these, you know, collections of neurons. So if something crashes here, it's running three or four other places, and on average, the best solution will be found. And, uh, to limit yourself to static thinking because you only are brave enough to do exactly, to execute exactly that code you've only ever written before and has passed the rigor of, say, the GNU compiler. You know, while it might make for a great driver for a 3D engine in a video game, uh, it's really terrible for creative systems, for things where you're trying to make discoveries things that you never knew before and you want to try uh, all kinds of variations and uh, you know self-modifying code and uh, I like that kind of stuff and I found the bravery to do it once I realized that servers were these you know just uh, kind of throw away things disposable units all that matters about a server is the data that lives on it and your ability to preserve the important parts of that and reinstantiate it again, maybe 10 more times. Uh, there's some concern with data leaks if uh, something goes wrong that allows someone else to get in and be involved in the crashing uh, of that machine. That they can pull out all kinds of data or not let it crash and just sit there and listen. But once again, different classes of apps. If you're making some sort of banking application, fine, you have to worry about that. But if you're making something that's gonna help a robot walk, you know, what do you care about this locked down security on these uh, sub sections of a system that you're just gonna re instantiate from scratch again later anyway? Um, don't limit yourself. Uh, dynamic languages. Uh, have a lot to offer and uh, have lower barriers to entry and uh, when those you know rule enforcers step in and try doing the human equivalent of all those principles that they learned in their comp sci 101 courses uh, insisting that's the only way this stuff can be done uh, you know you've got one of those static minds looking over your shoulders, just dying to come in and make no greater contribution than pep aid enforcement. And, uh, you know, those people really aren't worth interacting with, you know, just sort of edit them, edit them out of your awareness. Uh, but if you can't, ask them to create, contribute something. Contribute something that is not following those detailed rules that alleviate you of the need to actually think creatively for yourself. And so that's what I'm actually here doing. I'm uh, focusing on projects and tackling them in ways which demand that sort of creative thought. 
and do on occasion invite in what I'm coming to understand are, you know, nothing more than YouTube trolls, people who think they know a bit more than you because maybe they went to a comp sci course and uh, learned that the only way to work is with static variables or else your code is shit. And uh, to those people, well, you know, all there is is uh, the world as evidence that there is another way and that these uh, ways are not binary, they're just uh, points on a spectrum. And you as a developer can choose to be exactly where you want to be on that spectrum. Don't let anybody tell you that the principles that are, say, taught in comp sci uh, using Java are the principles that should be applied to Python because they're not. Python developer can in fact be more powerful due to the dy dynamic nature of its uh, execution environment. And if you want that speed, PyPy or Euphora or one of the many other execution environments that bring back more of that static compile uh, benefit uh, of speed and optimization. But if you're going for the flexibility, don't be phased by anyone or anything, no matter how loud they like to shout in your background. They're just passers-by, and when you let them go, they'll just sort of fade away, and then you can get back to what's important. Thanks for joining me. Hope to talk to you again soon, and don't forget to subscribe.